Well, greetings everybody. So I want to take some time to show you how to solve this problem which I've included on our assignment. And it goes like this. It says that we're basically filling a reservoir with a pipe and um, the reservoir is empty when the pipes open at t is equal to zero. And I've got this function that tells me how fast water is flowing into the reservoir. And about that, I'm asked a series of three questions. All right. So let me do this. Let me let me go to my work and summarize how I think the problem is given to us. And then I'll start solving part A. OK. All right. So I've got basically two things, I think. There's this function Q of T, which tells me the amount in cubic meters of water in the reservoir at any time, times measured in hours. It says in addition to that, as I read just a second ago, that it's empty at time T is equal to zero. Or I guess you could say that Q of zero is zero, okay? And then I'm given this other thing. Uh, it says Q prime of T, which is 35 times one plus cosine pi over 12 T, and that tells me how fast the water is flowing into the reservoir at any moment, okay? So because this tells me how fast water is flowing into the reservoir at any moment, it's an instantaneous rate of change, okay? Uh, it's a derivative, in other words. That's why it says Q prime of T. It's the derivative of Q of T, whatever that happens to be. And its units are in cubic meters per hour. Now, I want to, uh, tie this back to some things we learned when we learned about derivatives, okay? And I wanna do that because I wanna address why the units of Q prime of T are in cubic meters per hour, all right? So what we learn is that the instantaneous rate of change will be approximately equal to the average rate of change out of the original function. Okay, so in our case, I could say Q prime of T will be approximately equal to delta Q over delta T so long as delta T is reasonably small, okay? And it's because of that that we know what the units of Q prime of T are because delta Q over delta T, well, individually, those things are the change in Q where Q is the amount of water in the reservoir measured in cubic meters, over the change in t, where t is the time measured in hours. So that's why q prime of t has units of cubic meters per hour, all right? Okay, so that's just me wanting to sort out the pre preliminary information given to us in this problem. Now, as far as, as how to solve it, uh, first question is, uh, with this information, um, how much water flows into the reservoir over the first two hours. So like, so say from time t is equal to zero to time t is equal to two hours, okay? How much water goes in? So I'll, I'll say it like this. Uh, I have something, q prime of t, which tells me how fast water is going in. How would I figure out how much water goes in? So you see those two things? See how they're different? So this tells me how fast water is flowing in in cubic meters per hour, and I wanna know how much water has flowed in in cubic meters, okay? All right, so the short answer on how to figure that out is by way of this definite integral. Definite integral from t is equal to zero to two, q prime t dt, okay? That's what will tell me the amount in cubic meters that flows into the reservoir over that two hour period as given, okay? But I want to, briefly discuss why use this definite integral to answer that question. Uh, one way to do it uh, that is very simple to understand but does leave out a lot of detail is this. So notice in my integral I have q prime t dt. Let's think about each of these things. q prime t is a function that gives us a number in cubic meters per hour. dt this differential, we might think of that like delta t, uh, or that it has the same units as the variable t. So that would be units of hours. And what do you get when you multiply cubic meters per hour times hours over one? Like if you're thinking about dimensional analysis. 
the hours would cancel, we'd get cubic meters. Okay, so that's why it tells us, gives us a number in cubic meters. Now, that leaves out a lot of the discussion that would happen in Calculus 1 about this kind of thing, but none, nonetheless, this still works. I can at least figure out what kind of measurement this integral is giving me, and that is going to tell me what I want in this case. Uh, the bigger discussion might be that, well, the integrals, uh, definite integral, comes from a certain kind of limit of a Riemann sum, and the Riemann sum would be, you know, delta t's out of the partition times function values out of sample points and then when you multiply those two things to get your Riemann sum it would have these units and so there you go you're getting something in cubic meters okay uh, now let's do this so we got to solve this integral let's do do it this way we would use the fundamental theorem of calculus to solve this integral okay and what that means is that I find the antiderivative of this function, q prime of t, all right? And I evaluate it between the upper and lower bound of the definite integral, okay? So what that says is that, well, we must need the antiderivative in order to get anywhere doing it this way. So let's talk about that. How do we get the antiderivative of 35 times one plus cosine pi over 12 t? All right. So the way that it would occur to me to do that is by u substitution, okay? And I know that you can use calculators and all that kind of stuff to evaluate integrals. And, you know, I guess that with all that available, you don't have to write it on paper and use u substitution, but it is an objective of our class that you learn how to do u substitution. So I'm gonna show you that way, and that's what I'm obligated to uh, have you show me okay so here goes uh, I'll use u substitution I think if I let u be pi over 12 t I could turn this into a fairly simple integral like you know it would if I made that su substitution correctly this would just say cosine u and that would be very simple to integrate so I'll let u be pi over 12 t in order to achieve that goal if I let u be pi over 12 t, that makes du pi over 12 dt. I don't see that I have exactly pi over 12 dt, okay? Uh, I, I have dt, so I'll multiply both, this, both sides of this by 12 over pi, and I get that dt can be substituted as 12 over pi du. All right, so I get that, right? We're making the substitution in this step right here, and I'll, this 12 over pi is a factor of multiplication that I can remove. I'll remove the 35 also. What I have sitting right here is 35 times 12 divided by pi. That's 420 divided by pi. So I'll factor that out. And then what's the antiderivative of one with respect to the variable u? Because we made our substitution and put our problem in terms of u, that's our variable. The antiderivative of 1 with respect to u is u, because the derivative of u is 1. And of cosine u, it's sine u. And I have my constant of integration. So putting our original variable t back in, I substitute back for u pi over 12 t, and I get it. So that's the antiderivative that I'll use in the fundamental theorem of calculus. I will omit the plus c. I don't have to use the plus c in the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, but I'll use this. I'll say more about the C later. So, okay, back to what we were doing. Here's the integral that I needed to evaluate. Here's the antiderivative I just found. I put two in first, I get this. I subtract, I put zero in second. I get zero and zero for each term. And that turns out to be, if calculated, 136.85 cubic meters okay so I calculated that directly just by calculator and it said to round to two decimal places so that's what I did all right so that's part a part B can you find the function that gives the amount of water in the reservoir over the interval 0 to t so it's like saying is there a function that tells you how much water is is in there at any moment okay what I've just done is say, well, how much is in there at the end of two hours at that precise moment? But B is saying, 
well, so how much is in there at any time? Like, is there just some formula that tells me, you know, you give me the time, I put the number in there, and it tells me how much water is in the reservoir. That's what B is asking for. But I'll, I'll think about it like this, okay? I'll say, well, you know, Q of T is the antiderivative Q prime because, I mean, you take the derivative of Q and you get Q prime, okay? Uh, so, all right, that, that would seem to work. And we've already found that, you know, when, when I worked this out over here and I, I found the antiderivative of 35 times 1 plus cosine pi over 12 t, I, I basically got that. But I would have to work something out about that constant, okay? So Q of t is the antiderivative of Q prime. Q of t, which is what I'm looking for at this moment in part b, is something that if you took the derivative of it, you would get Q prime. And if you took the derivative of this, you would. But see that plus C right there? That could be plus any constant. So no matter what that number is, you know, I get all this stuff, 420 over pi, bracket, pi over 12 T, all that, but plus any fixed number. Like that, if that was plus seven, the derivative of this would still give you that. That's why plus C is a generic constant. Because no matter what constant I add on the end of this, it will check out as the antiderivative. So I'll need that number to verify my condition that Q of zero is zero, okay? So yes, Q of T is actually this with the plus C, but if Q of zero is zero, meaning when I put zero for T into this, this whole thing, including that plus C right there, it has to give me zero as a result. If I then solve for C, it says C is equal to zero. Okay, so there you have it. Uh, Q of T is just that antiderivative that I got and used in part A, okay? All right, last question. When is the reservoir full? Because at this point, I know how much water is in there at any time. It's this thing, Q of T 420, over pi, et cetera, without that constant, or that constant is technically zero. So, okay, how do I know when it's full? Well, how much does it hold? It did say that the reservoir has a capacity of 3,500 cubic meters. So the answer to when it's full is to solve for time this equation. This is Q of T, which tells me how much is in there. And I wonder at what time is it 3,500, okay? So there you go. Now. I don't know how to solve that. I put some thought into this. I think it'd be really difficult to solve. Uh, I, I don't even know. I mean, I, I don't want to say it's not possible to solve on paper, but, but I think it'd be very hard. And I do notice about this problem, it has this dash T there, which it means a problem that we'd use technology to solve. So let's say, can't solve this on paper. At least, at least I can't, and I don't think most people could. Um, if you can solve it on paper without any help from anything, I would like to hear that, but I don't think you can. So I think in this case, it's fine to use something like a calculator or here I use Wolfram Alpha. I don't have a graphing calculator. So I use that and I, I just said solve it. And here's how it gave me the solution that on the number line there, that blue dot's the answer. That's T that gives me the solution to that equation. It says 98.048, okay? So, and I round that to two decimal places. Like it says, I get 98.05. All right, so that's how it's done, all right? Um, hope that would answer any concerns you had about this one going through it if you had tried to solve it on your own. The only other thing I can think of is this last part. If it was say a test question and the browser's locked down and you couldn't go to Wolfram Alpha or something like that. How would you solve it? Well, in that case, I don't think it's fair as a test question. I can't pick and choose which parts show up here. Like if I add this question, all three par parts show up. So you just have to be excused to not answer the last part, but of course you get credit for it. 